We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 18 as we consider the topic, God destroys the wisdom of the wise. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the understanding of those who have understanding. I will confound. Where is the wise person? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than mankind, and the weakness of God is stronger than mankind. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the insignificant things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no human may boast before God. But it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for opening our eyes. Before coming to know you, we took great pride in various accomplishments or in our looks, in our wealth, in our strength, in our achievements, whatever it may be. But once we've come to know you, once you've opened our eyes, we've come to understand that all that is empty boasting. And you're showing us more and more that our boast is in you, that you are the praise of our lips and of our hearts, that you are the one that we will always glory in throughout eternity. And everything that we may boast in today will be of no consequence in a matter of time. But you will always be the greatest boast of all. So Lord, there are those who still don't know you as their glory, as their boast. They don't know you as their God, their Savior. Would you, in your great mercy, open their eyes, draw them to yourself, so they will experience the new birth. Have mercy on lost souls again and again. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Please be seated, beloved. Imagine for a moment that you had a disease, a particular wound maybe on your arm that was not healing. And all the various drugs and all the topical ointments have proven useless. You've tried one after another. And seeing that you are at your wit's end, you go to the doctor and say, is there anything, anything else? And uh, he points to something that history and even recent history has proven to be very effective for the condition that you have. 
There's just one thing you need to know about this remedy, the doctor says. This medical treatment involves the use of maggots, disgusting things, to consume the dead tissue on your wound. It cleans it up altogether. Would you go for this revolting solution? Or would you keep battling away with drugs and ointments in the hope that those would work? Could you get past the yuck factor? The yuck factor is basically how revolting those maggots would look on your wound. Maggot therapy was used during the Civil War and even in World War I. And now, as of recent, it's making a comeback in the world of medicine. But there is this big barrier to maggot therapy. The big, the big mag, uh, barrier is overcoming the pure human revulsion, the revulsion you feel when you see the maggots on your body. This saving remedy is there and it's very effective, but it carries a huge yuck factor that has to be overcome. And in our passage, we read of a much greater yuck factor. A yuck factor that is found in what Paul describes the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul speaks of the foolishness of the cross, the weakness of the cross. And it was a yuck factor in his day, and ever since then, it has been a yuck factor factor. Paul speaks of the message at the heart of the Christian faith, the message of Christ crucified. Now that's dear to us. We love that message as believers, but believe you me, it is terribly revolting in the eyes of many. It's because it's the Son of God who has been rejected, shamed, and killed on a cross to bring forgiveness of sins through the faith of in Jesus Christ. In Paul's day, and ever since then, the cross has been viewed illogical, barbaric, and disturbing, revolting to the max. So you can imagine how this outside perception, this view from the world, would put pressure on the Corinthians. It puts pressure on us as well to change the tune a little, to put aside the cross just a little, Why focus on a message that is so unappealing when focus on something that is more appealing, more acceptable to those we are trying to reach? Things like wisdom or knowledge, other virtues, doing good works, whatever it may be that can perhaps work well with Christianity. They jive well. They they go in well with Christianity. And today many think this as well. Many Christians Not non-believers. Non-believers don't care, but Christians. Why focus, they say, on the message of the cross and talk of people's sin and of repentance and the need of forgiveness when that message offends? It offends. Why not place our focus on some other things? Some things that Christians uphold as well, like justice, mercy, social justice, feeding the poor, How about diversity, inclusivity? And in response to this way of thinking, Paul says, I don't hold back from preaching the offensive message of the cross. He says, do not move what is central to Christianity. He says this to the Corinthians because the Corinthians had moved it. That's why he starts this way. The main thing must remain the main thing. Paul is saying the cross will always, always be foolish. Never in the 2,000 years since the death of Christ has the cross been acceptable. Never. Oh, they may accept the icon. They may accept certain uh, symbols of the cross. And and they may accept doing the sign of the cross or whatever else. But the message of the cross, the central message that we are sinners alienated from God, and that only through the death of Christ 
Are we reconciled to God and no other way? That message is repulsive. There's a yuck factor to the message of the cross. And Paul says, I will keep proclaiming it as truth because it is central to the Christian faith. And today we're going to be looking at Paul's main argument as to why. And then we're going to be looking at the evidence he gives to convince the Corinthians that this is the only message we have. The first thing he says is, shows is the foolishness of God. Verse 18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The foolishness of the message. It's through the message of the cross that people are saved from God's judgment of sin, from the wrath that is going to happen at judgment day. That they, it is through the foolishness of the cross that we are brought into a relationship with God. That's the only way we can know God. I know people that have said, you know, I can know God on a golf course. I don't think so. I know God in the wild when I'm surrounded by trees and nature. I commune with God. No, you don't. You get to know an aspect of God, but you don't get to know God that way. God is only revealed through the cross. There is a general understanding of God through nature, but not the specific understanding, not this relational understanding. We cannot come to know God, and God will not reveal himself apart from the cross. Otherwise, why did he put his son through all of that? That is the message of Paul. And this is what Paul clearly says in verse 18. Ever since the earliest days of the church, Christians have had to grapple with the awkward tension there is. In one, one hand, we rejoice as believers over the fact that through the cross, I have been saved. I rejoice that way. I've been forgiven because of the cross. My heart has been changed from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh because of the cross. But on the other hand, we feel the ridicule. We feel the judgment of others when we speak about the cross. We have difficulty talking about the cross. We can talk about, oh, the church is involved in this and the church is involved in that. But go to the really crux. Go to, pun intended, go to the cross and watch how they back off. You follow a humiliated and crucified Savior? You've got to be kidding me. That's, the, that's what they're saying. There's an ancient piece of graffiti taken from the 2nd or 3rd century that provides a window on how people felt about the message of the cross. And they show, this, this graffiti shows, the worshiping of a crucified man is like worshiping a crucified donkey. In his book, The God Delusion, the well-known atheist Richard Dawkins says this about the cross. I have described atonement, the central doctrine of Christianity, at least he gets it, as vicious, sadomasochistic, and repellent. We should also dismiss it as barking mad. Basically is saying... It's stupid. It's foolish. The prevailing wisdom of most elites throughout history has been that the message of the cross is foolishness. You have to be barking mad to believe it. Do you believe it? You are barking mad. But notice that God doesn't play by the rules of the world. In fact... It's like he takes all the proud assumptions that lead people to dismiss the cross and turns them on their head. Look at what Paul says in verses 19 and verse 20. Paul, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the understanding of those who have understanding. I will confound. Where is the wise person? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom 
of the world. These verses, by the way, they're, they are quoting, Paul's quoting verse Isaiah 29, are not saying that God is against wisdom. He's not saying that. We have a whole section of scriptures called the wisdom literature, right? Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and so forth. These, are, these books are part of the wisdom literature. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. No, God is, Paul's not saying that God is against wisdom, but what he is saying is that God is turning on its head here the wisdom of man because he believes he can approach God on his own terms, that he can know God on his own terms, and he doesn't need revelation from God. It's a wrong assumption that humanity makes of him when it comes to knowing him and being accepted by him. Many people will say these words. I hope that one day I'll be accepted because of what I've done. See, they strongly believe in this. This is their understanding. When it comes to God, the world's experts on religion and philosophy are the ones who get it wrong. The message of the cross turns the wisdom of the wise upside down. It confounds the teacher of the law. It brings to naught the debater of this age. People will never come to know God through their so-called wisdom, through the philosophies of this world. Never. But only through the foolish message of the cross. Listen again to Paul's reasoning in verses 21 to 23. For since in the wisdom of God, in the, in the mind of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, to Gentiles, foolishness. Imagine, this is your audience. This is the world. You got Jews, and you got the Greek-speaking world, right? That's what, it says, that's what it means by Greeks, not just the people from Greece. The Greek-speaking, because Greek language was the language of the world. So you got the Jews and the Greek-speaking world. That's your entire audience. And Paul says, what I have to offer is foolish in their eyes. It's con considered stupid. Why was the message of, of the cross so difficult to accept by both Jewish audience and Gentile audience? Well, in terms of the Jews, they were simply appalled by the idea that their promised Messiah would be crucified on a Roman cross. To them, that would be unacceptable. In their eyes, the Messiah was going to come and crush the enemy, not be crushed. That makes no sense. What kind of Messiah is that? And so for the Jews, Jesus was unacceptable, revolting. The Jews were looking for salvation from Rome, not salvation from their real problem, from sin. A crucified Messiah was unthinkable. As far as the Gentiles were concerned, they could not cope with the cross because it was revolting. Anyone who died on the, cross, on the Roman cross was difficult to look at. The Greek or Roman world valued traits as wisdom, power, style, looks, wealth, things that made you look impressive, things that made you look good, things that win respect. They wanted to follow in the footsteps of the great philosophers such as Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. These men were highly esteemed. What does a guy dying on the cross have to do with getting me better? Compared to these great thinkers, a crucified Savior was viewed as crazy. Crazy. Unacceptable. I don't believe in that. And when you think of this, you can imagine how difficult it was for Paul and the apostles to break through in that world and preach this gospel. And yet they did. It's hard for us to contemplate just how much horror and shame the cross was viewed as. 
It was contemptible in every way possible. This form of death was inhumane, a form of capital punishment amongst the Romans that was looked down upon as the worst. It was so distasteful that Cicero of Rome speaks of crucifixion as something that should be removed not only from Rome, but even from their thoughts, their eyes, their ears. Remove it. It's disgusting. And God chose the most disgusting thing and put his very son on that because that's the way he was going to save sinners. The cross was a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles. It was an awkward and an uncomfortable reality. And the people we interact with feel the same way. And many times as Christians, we find ourselves not knowing what to say or how to bring up the message of the cross. I remember when I told my friends that I was going to leave for ministry when I was a young man, and uh, I could have gone into business and continued that way. Instead, I chose to leave the path of business and take the path of ministry to begin to preach the message of the cross. And I remember my friends and the shock on their faces when I told them this. One of them even said, why are you wasting your life? Why are you doing this to yourself? You see, the cross is foolishness to everybody. And there may be here someone who sees it as such even today. Secondly, Paul says, that it's not only foolishness, it's also the weakness of God. In verses 24 and 25, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than mankind. The weakness of God is stronger than mankind. Not only do we see the wisdom of God perfectly manifested in the foolishness of the cross, but we also see the power of God manifested in the weakness of the cross. It's the wisdom of God because it's the full revelation of God's wisdom since it speaks of God's remarkable love for sinners, but it also speaks of his great power manifested in the cross. How could something so ugly and revolting be the manifestation of his greatest power. For example, we may see that God's great power when he created all the universe or when he delivered Israel from Egypt. That's a display of power we can understand. We can relate to slaves being brought through the Red Sea and brought into the wilderness and for 40 years accompanied by God's great display of power. We can't understand that kind of power when we look at the cross. We don't see power there. We see weakness. Not only foolishness, but weakness. But the cross speaks of power. Because in the cross, we see how God sees sin. He sees sin as the most serious problem. And he sees the cross as the most important and perfect cure for sin. We see God's commitment to justice through the death of Jesus Christ. There is no other justice but the one that God brought about through the cross. The cross speaks of God's sovereign power, for he takes something so revolting and uses it to his glory for the salvation of the lost. We see him using the most vile act in history, the murder of his holy and beloved son as part of a glorious plan, a plan that was conceived in eternity past and perfectly carried out in the fullness of time. Here comes his son, not to come on a white horse, shining, defeating the enemies of this world, but to do the unthinkable and give his life for his beloved flock. The only way to truly know God as infinitely powerful, loving, is to look at the cross and see the power of God displayed there. There you'll find his wisdom. There you'll find his power. It wasn't just a good man that died and hung on a cross it was a son of God, the promised Messiah. Only he was the perfect, sinless God-man who had the power and authority to give his life and to take it back 
could atone the sins of those who believe. B.B. Warfield, a well-known theologian, sums it up like this. A Christless cross, no refuge for me. In other words, a Christ without the cross, presenting a Christ with taking away the death and the shame and the guilt, all that is encompassed and wrapped up in the cross. A Christless cross, no refuge for me. A crossless Christ, my Savior, may not be. But oh, Christ crucified, I rest in thee. We rest in the message of Christ crucified because it is the only one that removes the penalty. That's how powerful it is. So we see not only the wisdom of God, but the power of God because it removes the penalty. We are justified. We are no longer under condemnations. A condemnation, Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation for the believer because of the cross. We are made right, not through our achievement, not through our good works, not through our law-keeping, not through our intellect or success. It's only through the death of Christ. That's how powerful it is. We're made right in the presence of God. I despise the cross. I ignore the cross. I am no longer right. I am not right before God. I'm under condemnation. I'm under judgment. A Christianity that focuses on social issues without the cross is an empty gospel. A Christianity that focuses on self-improvement, 10 steps to be a better person, all that kind of stuff, without the cross is an empty gospel. A Christianity that focuses on social reforms, and we need social reforms, but without the cross, just having conservative values in our, in our country, in our province, and conservative values in our schools, because much of that is, going, is jettisoned out the window. Having all that and yet no cross, it's an empty gospel. A Christianity that focuses on the manifestation of gifts. And gifts have their place in the body of Christ. But the cross is central Jesus crucified. That's the focus. As Spurgeon said, a faith which rests short of the cross is a faith that will land you short of heaven. And so Paul makes the point. He argues, this is what you need to focus on, church of Corinth. And the Lord is telling us today, LCF, same thing. This is what you need to focus on. The main point must remain the main point. Even though in the eyes of many it is foolish. Even though in the eyes of everyone it is weakness. The fact is that God saves through the foolishness and the weakness of the cross. And now Paul goes to bring the evidence to show that this is true. What is the evidence? Verses 26 and 27. As he continues writing, notice he's arguing with them because they had come to believe something else. And these were Christians, saints, but they had shifted. They had left the, the path. So he's trying to bring them back. For consider your calling. Remember, they were called to be saints. Consider your calling, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. So what is he doing now? He, he's, he's shown the foolishness of the cross and how the world views it as such, and the weakness of the cross, and he shows that this is, it's all powerful because it takes away the penalty that we rightfully deserve as sinners and causes us to be justified by faith through grace. He shows all that. Now he goes to the evidence. What is the evidence that this is true? Look at yourselves. Look at yourselves, he says. Not many wise. Not many powerful. God has chosen the foolish things of the world. That's the evidence. 
that the cross-centered gospel is powerful and wise. He brings to light the weak people, the nobodies that make up the church of Corinth. He shows from their low status and their average lives, these weak, insignificant nobodies, that their salvation had nothing to do with them. They're not smart enough. They're not strong enough. They're not good enough. God saved you, nobodies. You're nobodies in the eyes of the world. Not only the cross is weak and considered as such, not only the cross is foolish, you're foolish. You're nothing. But God chose you, and he saved you. There is an expression that many believe when they feel that comes from Scripture. This is the expression. You may have heard of it. God helps those who help themselves. Right? We've heard it. I've heard it many times. I'm sure you have. And many believe that this is from Scripture. It's the idea that God favors and rewards those who are capable of helping themselves. And if you believe in this expression, then God does not get the glory since he is rewarding those who are doing the work. They're doing something. It's an expression that successful people, that ones who got it together are the ones that can get help from God. They boast in their achievements and therefore God is helping them. But this is the farthest farthest thing from the truth. God doesn't help those who help themselves. Absolutely not. God helps those who cannot help themselves. And while the world ignores the weak and the foolish and the unimpressive, God is drawn to them. He is drawn to sinners who deserve judgment. Notice how the church of Corinth turns the worldview on its head The members of this church were not impressive. They're not remarkable. They don't stand out. They're not successful in the eyes of the Corinthian society. They had found God's salvation, though. They had discovered God's grace because in his mercy, God had saved them. God chose the foolish, the unattractive, the unimpressive, and made them what? Special. He doesn't love us because we're special, but he loves us and with his love makes us special. At times, the church, we believers, highlight certain individuals and give, um, and make these expressions, or say this, to give Christianity some credibility. We say, by the way, you know this football player or or this soccer or baseball player? He's a Christian. Oh, you know this actor? You know this well-known actor? He's famous. Well, he's a Christian. (laughs) Oh, you know this businessman? He's a, he's a Christian. And so what are we trying to do? We're trying to give ourselves credibility. We're trying to make ourselves look good by saying, oh, don't look at us because we're nothing. Don't look at the cross. That's foolishness and weakness. But look at this actor. He's saying that it's good to believe in God. Please don't look at actors. Please don't look at celebrities. They got it all wrong most of the time. 99% of them. They haven't got a clue what Christianity is about. We look at the scriptures. We've got all that we need in the Bible. And in the Bible, we find out what Christianity is all about. You see, we do, by saying stuff like this, look at this actor, we do what God does not do. God doesn't say, oh, look at that. I find, hey, I saved the good one. Oh, you see that? Man, that soccer player. You see him? He's with us. God doesn't do that. God takes great joy and delight in saving the unimpressive, the unattractive, the insignificant, the weak, the foolish. So why are we doing what God does not do? Paul says God saved a bunch of nobodies, a bunch of misfits. And that's the evidence The Lord points to the average Joe and says, look at what I've done in them. Look at how I've turned sinners into saints. Look at how I've saved those 
with a messy past. The wise of this world write off the believers in Christ. Therefore, you see both God's message, considered foolish, and God's people, considered equally insignificant, are turning the wisdom of this world upside down. And it's been doing so for the past 2,000 years. It's not a message of power. It's not a message of might and style, but it's a message of the cross. It's not a people of power that God saves, of might, of significance. It's those who are nobody, weak and insignificant. Why does God do all this? Why? Why does he do it this way? Verse 28 and 29. And the insignificant things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify things that are, so that no human may boast before God. So that no human may boast before God. Oh, how we love to boast. We all do. It's in our DNA. <clears throat> I found myself boasting only to realize, why am I boasting about this? It's ridiculous. When we stop to consider all the empty boasting that we've engaged in, you know, we can stop half of our talk. Half. Just stop the boasting in things that don't matter. When we all stand before God one day, on that great day of judgment, no one is going to say to God, you know, Lord, you saved me. Of course you took me in and saved me. I was a person of value. <laughs> no one's going to say that. What would heaven be without me here? Heaven is more beautiful because of me. No one's going to say that. On that last day, God will look past those who have trusted in themselves, past those who saw value in themselves, past those who consider themselves important, gone way beyond that and pick out the, all the insignificant ones who have been saved by grace and give them great value. That's what he'll do. He will highlight the believer with the messy history, the one who never got recognized and viewed themselves as unworthy sinners. He will declare them accepted in Christ. These alone will be welcomed in the presence of God on the basis of the cross and not their credentials. Verse 30 says, but it is due to him it is due to him that you are in Christ. That expression, keep it in mind as we go through this letter. It is due to him. It's because of him. Not because of what you did, not because of what you have done, not your achievements, not anything that you can take credit for. It is due to him that you are in Christ. God never looked at you and said, I see something good in John. I'm going to save him because there's something good in him. He's worth this salvation. No, 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 no. God looked at his son. The, the son looked at the father. The spirit looked at the father and the son together. We will save the unsavable. We will turn them into saints. That is the plan of God. And it's a glorious plan. You see, angels are far better than you and I. Far better. But they are not in Christ fact, Peter says that the angels themselves look at this message of the cross and continue to study it because they are taken aback with wonder. How God is doing all this. How God is displaying his wisdom. How God is displaying his power. And how insignificant nobodies that slip through the, and fall through the cracks are being saved. And no one takes notice. All will be revealed in heaven. It's an amazing thing. And I say to myself, why am I a part of this? Why? How could God have chosen me? Sometimes I look at my life and I see my, my, my pedigree, which there's none. I see the family that I've come from, broken in so many ways. I say, Lord, why did you choose me? Why did you make me one of yours? Why did he do it? 
Because he saw some worth in me? No. Absolutely not. It's all because of his amazing grace. And that's why the song says amazing grace. Not amazing me. Amazing grace. How gloriously and mysteriously wonderful is this salvation. Sometimes I feel my words do not do it justice. They don't. I pray the Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see the wonder of the cross. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts. My stammering tongue, my poor thoughts have not done justice to what you are, to who you are and what you've done. They have not. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would draw many to yourself. The cross would become so wonderful in the eyes of those who are still in darkness. And that those who are believers and have lost sight of its glory and have been duped into thinking that we can present the church in a different way so that it could be presentable and acceptable to those who are unreached. Forgive us when we think this way and deliver us from this lie. May the cross be always our boast. Thank you for saving us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We bless you and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.